Dr. Tessu, thank you very much for your welcome. And thank you also for making available this fantastic facility for our use today. As you can imagine, I felt deeply honored when I was asked to give this third Freeman Lecture. Indeed, doubly so, to be invited by such a distinguished, diverse, and international group as the Globelix Scientific, Commi Scientific Committee was a huge honor in itself. That was then deepened by the fact that, and the task was made more daunting, by the fact that I was being asked to follow in the steps of Luke Serta and Carlotta Perez, two giants in our field. There was also for me, and Ben Dockers hinted a bit at this, I think, a touching element of personal symbolism about this invitation. As, Chris, as, as, as Ben Docker mentioned, Chris uh, started my career in the innovation studies field by hiring me uh, in 1967 at Sprue, at Sussex. It was Chris also, two years later, who wondered whether I would go and work in Thailand uh, on a project working with a large public R&D facility and its interface with its industrial environment. And that reoriented my career towards the innovation, late industrialization uh, and development field. More than 45 years later, almost at the end of that career, it seems appropriate... This is your fault. <laughs> it seems appropriate that Chris is once again, uh, once again involved. So, members of the Scientific Committee, wherever you are, thank you very much for the honor and also for the opportunity uh, to acknowledge Chris's role in my journey through the Globelix field. Let me follow that with two apologies. One is about the absence of a paper behind this lecture. Because part of what I will talk about covers quite a lot of illustrative detail, I thought an accompanying paper would be useful but I haven't completed it. I will try to do so and let the uh, Globelic Secretariat have a copy uh, to be made available. The second apology is about this title behind me, <laughs> partly because it is awfully long and wordy. A reflection of my late indecision about quite how I was going to develop the content of the talk. As but also, uh, I must apologize for the fact that it doesn't even actually say anything about the main focus of what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> so let me say a little about that. When I was puzzling about the possible content of the lecture, I thought it might be sensible to try and focus on a topic where there was a connection between my own work uh, as Ben Docker uh, has described it, and at least some aspect of Chris's work. This led me in particular to, in, to his interest uh, in the institutional component of national innovation systems. Not just the organizational component, but also the wider complex of socio-political structures and processes and associated beliefs, principles, and values. This led me then to focus on what I'm calling the, well, the, the policy subsystem of the institutional component of national innovation subsystems. I'll shorten that to simply talk, say that I'm talking about policy, science, technology, and innovation policy systems, by which I mean roughly things to do with the organizational structures and processes of policy making, things to do with the broad presumptions, emphases, and cognitive framings, models, that shape approaches to policy, things to do with 
uh, interests, competences, and so on of the policy-making bureaucrats that shape also their approach to policy. Things to do with the internal and external policy and political interfaces between policy-making and uh, the, the social context. For instance, uh, Peter Evans' uh, outstanding work of some years ago on embedded autonomy, as one example. I will be dipping into the first three of those headings a little bit. I won't be saying anything about the fourth. And I should perhaps at this stage just flag something else that I'm not really going to address. One should make more explicit, I think, within this sort of list of headings, uh, issues to do with the um, uh, the components of, of, of the policy system concerned with, with data, statistics, indicators, and all of that apparatus that heavily shapes the way policy uh, is framed and, 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 and identified, uh, as well as issues about policy learning, policy learning processes, and so on. I won't be touching on those, but they should be in this pot, this rather messy, uh, eclectic pot. So from there, let me go on to just uh, comment a little bit on some of the conceptual and terminological furniture I will be uh, dealing with. First of all, uh, what I mean by industry is that I follow the convention that industry includes not just manufacturing, but manufacturing and at least the extractive industries, mining, petroleum, and so on, the construction industry, the utility industries, energy, water, sanitation, and so forth. For me, although I will be talking quite a lot about manufacturing, because that's where this field has led us, I will actually want to have in mind a much broader frame of reference. Then let me comment, perhaps, on the obvious and, and, or maybe less obvious, of quite what I mean by industrial development policy and industry-related science and technology and innovation policy. What am I talking about? Essentially two domains of policy making concerned with uh, uh, two fairly different sets of activities, capabilities and resources. On the one hand, at the bottom there in blue, uh, one talks, the, uh, 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 one can identify activities, capabilities for industrial production, uh, and at the top, activities and capabilities to generate technical and organizational change in production. I will tend to use the term production capacity to refer to the stock of resources providing or undertaking those activities, the physical capital, the human capital, the organizational capital, and so on, that constitutes, if you like, the production capacity in industry. And correspondingly, uh, I will be talking about innovation capabilities in a similar stock-like sense, uh, about the underlying uh, resources of, 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 of knowledge, um, human capital, bits of physical capital, organizational capital, and so on, but the stock of capabilities that delivers or implements, uh, if you like, innovative activities. From there, you know, it follows fairly obviously, policy for industry may be concerned with the sort of familiar uh, uh, areas of, 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 of activity about expanding production capacity, changing its structure, raising its efficiency, and more recently increasing its role in poverty reduction, making it greener, and so on and so forth. When, when I talk about science and technology, SDI policy, I will be talking primarily about two things. One, the component of SDI policy that is concerned with creating and accumulating the stock of innovation capabilities. And the slightly different thing, which is uh, the policy activity concerned with orienting, aligning, and coordinating science and technology activities. And I will be focusing primarily on the capability building dimension of science and technology policy uh, in uh, industrializing countries, and I will probably be, I would, I think, be referring to two ways in which one can think of that happening. Uh, 
one being essentially top-down, where one uh, is trying to build competences and capabilities in the areas of R&D and so forth, and the other which would be uh, uh, seen more as a bottom-up approach uh, to building capabilities uh, concerned with building capabilities for incremental improvement, reverse engineering, engineering and design and so forth. Let me just add a little word about STI policy. In the 1950s, no such thing existed. It wasn't there, hadn't been invented. It probably wasn't really the case that many people talked even about science policy. People did things that actually came to be called science policy, obviously, but it wasn't really until the 1950s and into the 1960s that people began to conceive of a, domain, a kind of modern, moderately coherent domain of policy concerned with science with science and technology, and later on down the track, the I was added and we came, came to deal with this notion of science, technology, and innovation policy as some sort of body domain of policy making. Uh, now, one of the difficulties about that history is that this domain of policy making came on the scene late. It was a newcomer to the bureaucratic game. Uh, how did you fit? this body of, of, of thinking of, of policy making that is actually claims to be cross-cutting across all areas of government, that's to do, whether it's to do with research or R&D or whatever, the claim was that this area of policy was cross-cutting uh, relative to uh, the existing structure of essentially sectoral and functional departments and ministries concerned with industry and energy and agriculture and the health and, and so on and so forth. There was a conundrum about how you stitch these two rather different kinds of policy making together within the bureaucratic structure. And that's a conundrum that governments across the world have been grappling with uh, almost ever since. So, why do I think it's worth exploring this STI policy system idea a little bit? Partly the answer is it because it's been relatively neglected. When we have come to wonder why STI policy may do or does or doesn't do this or that or the other, or even whether uh, policy for industry does or doesn't do this or that or the other, we have tended to jump quite a long way back in the, the sort of framework of things to some of the big issues. The important big issues, sure, national political economy issues, globalization and globalization governance rules issues and so on. Uh, the neoclassical paradigm and its dominance over, uh, at least in certain times and places. The ICT, etc. We, we've jumped. To, to, to see how policy may be shaped, influenced, constrained, or uh, uh, facilitated uh, by these sorts of things. And I think we've probably jumped over the, the, the possible role that is played by the industry-oriented STI policy system that may actually shape and constrain policy itself in, in various ways. Um, and that's what I, I want to pick up. All I'm doing, I think, is going to suggest that uh, it may be useful to put this box in the middle a little more centrally into the, anal into the analytical framework and give it a little bit more attention uh, in our uh, policy research-related uh, activities. I'm probably not going to go much further than that. I'm certainly not going to try and develop a kind of model that links all these bits and pieces together. That would be foolish indeed. But there are others for thinking this, other reasons for thinking this might be imp important. There appear to be developments in African contexts that require both one, radical shifts in the current nature of industry-oriented STI policy, perhaps also therefore requiring change in the underlying STI policy system. And that connects up with, with, with three issues. 
with a possible need for closer integration between industry policy and industry-related science and technology policy that seems to be emerging from recent shifts in the debate about industry policy. I will elaborate in a minute. The second issue is about the heterogeneity of modes of innovation and the implications of that in the context of the changing composition of African industrial growth. I will elaborate a little. And the third is about the legacy of UNESCO's science, technology and innovation policy role over three decades across the developing world through the 1960s to 1980s, through the 1980s. And I will elaborate a little on that. Let me take the first issue. Danny Roderick recently, well not so recently I guess, uh, reflecting on the emergence of a less ideological and more pragmatic debate that was beginning to emerge about industry policy, suggested that we now confront a rare historic opportunity to fashion an agenda for economic policies that takes an intelligent intermediate stand between the two extremes. I'm not entirely sure about the intermediate stand, but never mind the idea of uh, fashioning an agenda for a new economic uh, policy concerned with industrial development, I think is, is, is an interesting idea. I would essentially go on to argue, I think, that this may also be a historical opportunity to fashion a new agenda for industry-related STI policies. Not just the economics dimension, but the STI-related dimension. Steps in that direction have been taken in at least two ways. Roderick himself, for instance, has highlighted, and perhaps in particular, has highlighted the entrepreneurial activity of entering into new-to-the-economy areas of production, structure-changing uh, 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 entries into, 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 new, into new production. And he has emphasized several things uh, about that. He's emphasized that a large part of that activity involves knowledge production and essentially innovation activities uh, that he gave the, I think, unfortunate title to of self-discovery, but it, that's what seems to be there. Um, essentially, he was talking about uh, a phase in the activity of identifying markets, identifying prices, identifying technologies, identifying costs, assessing feasibilities of technologies, uh, the uh, uh, acquisition of technologies, the uh, assessment of profitability and viability of this new to the economy thing in the economy where it was going to be introduced. Not a lot different from the other kind of innovation uh, that we give so much attention to. But essentially he, he was saying, look, this is a knowledge intensive component of the entrepreneurial act, if you like. He emphasized also the externalities and spillovers from that. People who fall along behind the initiator uh, have had a large amount of the risk and uncertainty reduced. Uh, and can more easily uh, move in and invest and expand that area within the economy. And in later publications, uh, later work, Roderick went on in to, to elaborate on, on this and to begin to talk about very specific lists of STI-related policy as elements of larger policy packages uh, to foster structural change uh, in industrializing economies. Then also, uh, in two conferences about, I don't know, a couple of years, three years ago, um, interesting things were said. Uh, these conferences were about the industrial policy revolution and the debate about it. Uh, one was broad and, and generic, and one of these was specifically <coughs> focused on Africa. Stiglitz and other eminent contributors to those conferences emphasized the importance to industry policy of policies concerned with learning and innovation. And they argued, for instance, that policy for industrial development 
should, in their language, create a learning economy. And, and they started to use that kind of language, uh, the language that, if you like, we, <laughs> Gobelics, uh, would, would understand. But in both these cases, the way the STI components of either Roderick's work or these kind of vague notions about learning societies were really imperfectly developed. Uh, they, 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 there is an enormous uh, further activity to do. These contributions have opened up a discussion. They've hardly scratched the surface of what needs to be done. And I'm suggesting that maybe there is a challenge for Globelics. Let me pick up on the point about heterogeneity and modes of, innov of modes of innovation and the possible implications for Africa. We know, thanks not least to Franco sitting at the front here, about the diversity <coughs> and heterogeneity of ways in which innovation is done as between sectors. I think we know a bit less about a, another work that I think is important and still under-recognized. This was the work about modes of innovation uh, by uh, Ben Dorka and colleagues in Denmark about STI mode, science, technology, and I can't remember what the I is, modes, and DUI, modes of innovation. Essentially, the STI mode was about the one we know all about. Yeah, it was the science intensive, R&D intensive, um, links with universities and, and the like, uh, formal knowledge uh, bases, etc. And the other was much more concerned with innovation that was based on doing, on practice, on, on uh, using technologies and on interacting uh, both within organizations and between organizations. These were just different ways of innovating. They were not better or worse. Indeed, they were rather similar in terms of their effects. Uh, but they were, they were different and effective in different contexts, in their own contexts. The bit that I found really rather interesting in, in, in that paper is the discussions every so often scattered through it about the way in which the STI mode is, if I may translate their paper into my, my terminology for today, is embedded in a particular policy system, a set of preconceptions, a set of institutional and organizational arrangements for policy making, a set of, of, of data and, and statistics that frame a way of going about policy making and so on. The STI mode was embedded in, I'm translating a bit, but was embedded in a very distinct policy system. And therefore, that shaped the way policy in that area for, for innovation uh, was, was conducted. There are other players in the modes of innovation game. One input is, I think, particularly important. That is what has come to be called or known as project-based innovation. Again, a different way of innovating, uh, not, in, not really in manufacturing. Uh, it's about the ways of innovating in industries where very large projects are dominant vehicles for the introduction of new technology in, into, into production, uh, the extractive industries, infrastructure, utilities, and so on and so forth. And the way in which innovation is done in those, we have learned mainly from the work of a body of people currently at uh, Imperial College of the University of London, um, used to be at Sprue, some of them. Um, they've identified this as a very different way of going about the business of innovating that doesn't, it's completely different from the way in which most of the policy related debate about innovation uh, presumes. So, now, uh, da 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 da. Um, what is interesting about the, the, this, this project-based mode of innovation is that it is the way it seems to be the way in which a large fraction of innovation is undertaken within these kinds of industries, which seem to be precisely the kinds of industries that are emerging as the high-growth sectors uh, in, the, in, in African industrialization. 
So we may be in a situation where different modes of innovating typically confront uniform policy regimes, perhaps especially in Africa. And if that's a problem in Denmark, I would argue it's probably a bigger problem in Africa. Not because Denmark's a little place, uh, but because this, this structure of industry with a particular mode of innovation that is not the one we've been talking about for the last 30 years or whatever it is. Uh, that, that, that's a problematic situation. Then let me say a little bit about the legacy of UNESCO's STI role through the 1960s to 80s. The UNESCO Science, and Science Policy Division had a massively influential role in shaping and standardizing two features of uh, science and technology policy systems in developing countries through, the, through those years, including very many in Africa. There were two, two features that were particularly important in their package uh, of uh, their message. One was about the place of science and technology policy within the bureaucratic structure of government. It should be a cross-governmental overarching domain of policy. It should be located at the highest level of government, preferably the president's office or equivalent. And it should be seen as trying to coordinate uh, the whole array of uh, science technology activities uh, within those, those, those vertical uh, slices of the government system. Secondly, they set up, they, had a, they, they <coughs> sold a standardized set of expectations about what the science and technology system consisted of, and therefore what the role of science and technology policy in relation to that uh, system should be about. And I, I don't know if you can... <laughs> well, that's not bad. Um, this model, a cybernetic model, no less, uh, was included, it was a central feature of a 1970s manual, training manual, uh, for science and technology policy officials and so on across the developing world, mid-1970s or thereabouts. It's a bit complicated, but it has four main components. One is on the left, the state budget. The next, the second is center top. In effect, when you read, take this into account with a little bit of the text, this is essentially about R&D activities, or so the few little bits and pieces around the edges, undertaken in public centers and institutes, period. The third part is bottom center, the national policy for science and technology, the job of which is effectively to operate on the, state, on the state budget, to push finance through the valve at the top in order to fund this centralized public's structure of R&D performance. The fourth, you barely notice, the fourth component. It's the little box just hanging on to the edge of the diagram up in the top right-hand corner. Users. Now, the text has about five words of explanation about what users do. In effect, they gratefully accept the delivery of, 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 of technological goodies from this bunch of boxes in the middle. They do nothing in the innovation process. They are a bucket into which you pour uh, the output from uh, the activities at the top. So you've got, in effect, uh, a view of what policy should focus its attention on. Which is, I would suggest, a touch narrow. But, I would also suggest that the institutional legacy and the conceptual legacy of this three decades worth of immensely directive persuasion is probably really quite important. <laughs>
And if you're beginning to talk about diversity in policy and different structures and so on, there may be constraints. Let me try and go quickly through another little point. What I would like to do next is just try and illustrate from the experience of a few countries what has actually happened in terms of, in, in, in this space, with respect to differences in industry STI, industry or industry uh, related STI policy systems, uh, some where STI policy was integrated with industry policy, closely integrated, others where it was disintegrated, uh, differences in policy practice that were associated with those system differences and differences in the path, paths of technological development that followed from there. This is the area where the background paper would be particularly useful, because I, a, a lot of detail here. Let me try and whistle through it rather quickly. <coughs> I'm essentially comparing the experience in Taiwan, Singapore, and experience in Thailand, uh, Thailand and Colombia. Uh, starting with, 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 with some aspects of what I'm calling the science, the, the policy system, the STI policy system. Uh, looking first of all at issues about visions and organizational structures. Uh, and the first item is essentially about the, 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 the importance of the, the vision, the importance attached to linking innovation to the development of industry, or linking the development of innovation capability to the development of industry. In an immensely strong belief, vision, driving force uh, in the case of both Taiwan and Singapore. That industrialization without building a significant innovation competence uh, would leave those economies in various ways uh, dependent on, 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 on the West which was very strong in the Taiwan-Singapore context, more an issue of general background and aim uh, in the other contexts. That vision was actually, was, was organizationally integrated in the context of, or, or was seen as being organization, or should it be organizationally <coughs> integrated, not overarching, but science and technology policy should be intimately connected with uh, in industrial policy. In the, other, in, in the other cases, that was much less uh, the case. Of. For example, in Thailand, it was not simply a question of this kind of science policy body responsible, thinking it was responsible for that area the Ministry of Industry not thinking it was responsible really for those issues about building innovative capability. There was a third actor, the Board of Investment, uh, which was set up separately, which was the body that approved for taxation handouts and one thing and another, uh, uh, proposals to invest in industry and so on. And in effect, that was the body that had potentially control over the conditionality on which uh, investment was permitted. And that was the body which could, in principle, and did in other places, uh, require firms to do certain, to undertake or be involved in certain sorts of technological behavior in order to qualify. Uh, in, in the Thai case, and that's my understanding, I'm not sure about the Columbia, but certainly in the Thai case, that was not, uh, that was not. We can go through it. Um, the uh, importance attached to cross-government bureaucracy uh, was str uh, strong in one case, limited or non-existent in the other. In the case of Singapore, for example, they did create a kind of UNESCO-type Ministry of Science and Technology, found it was unhelpful, and within eight years closed it down. Um, and really, the, 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 in Taiwan, that structure was very much oriented towards, if you like, the more academic end of, 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 of uh, science and technology in, in Taiwan, uh, and really had no bearing on, not little bearing on what was happening in relation to industry. Um, underlying principles uh, in, uh, about, for instance, the um, importance of creating innovation capabilities, uh, 
uh, clearly strong in, in, in views and, 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 and models and beliefs in Taiwan, Singapore, uh, somewhat less so in the other two. Uh, the att importance attached to building innovation capabilities in firms, a central strong presumption that that's what you did in Taiwan and Singapore, uh, given the limited emphasis in uh, Thailand, Colombia. Um, the uh, contrary issue about uh, the emphasis given to developing innovation capabilities in public institutes, the dominant perspective in the Thailand, Colombia context, uh, more or less absent uh, in Singapore, uh, although substantial in the case of Taiwan that set up a very large industrial R&D organization, the uh, Industrial Technology and Research Institute, ITRI. However, ITRI interpreted its role, saw its role in a very particular way. And here one can distinguish between kind of two underlying kind of what's the role of central R&D. One is the undertaking R&D for firms role, uh, underpinned by the kind of argument that uh, because firms in developing countries, da da da, uh, have limited capabilities to undertake innovation in their uh, in their own right, uh, it, one needs to establish uh, public in. Uh, centers uh, to undertake innovation for firms, to deliver uh, the answers, the solutions, the technology, and so on. Uh, an alternative view, uh, presumption, belief, uh, is that the role of a central ITRI type organization is partly to do that, but much more importantly, is to contribute to the development of innovation capabilities within the firms that didn't have them before, so that they do the <coughs> innovation for themselves, sort of. Um, one can then go on, and I won't go on to, uh, if you're interested, you can, you, you, in some time, you, you will be able to, to look at the paper. Um, they were, the approaches were similar with respect to tax and related incentives, incentives, very different in, with respect to the degree of leverage that <coughs> policy exercised on uh, the behavior of firms uh, in Taiwan, just as one example. Uh, the creation of a science park carried with it all sorts of advantages to do with tax and this and that and the next thing. But the condition for being admitted to the park was that you uh, had this, did the R&D, had this strength of that, and, and you were an active innovator. And there was a significant incentive, therefore, for firms uh, to engage in those sorts of activities. Or that would seem to be the story. I won't elaborate on these details. There were significant differences essentially in the ways in which these two pairs of countries went about uh, the practical, the practice, if you like, uh, of, um, in, uh, of science, technology, innovation policy in, in, in relation to, to industry. The paths of industrial technological development experienced in those two pairs of countries were widely different. As is a matter of some familiarity. The extent of structural change in the industrial economy in Taiwan and Singapore, as you all know, was immense. Huge shifts from uh, labor-intensive production of various sorts in the 1960s to uh, very large shares in meaningful um, high-technology-intensive industries. Uh, in contrast, rather low shifts in that sort of structure uh, in Taiwan, uh, in Thailand and, and, and Colombia. The imitation to innovation transition was significant in 
Taiwan Singapore, again you all know it, uh, it is reflected poorly but nonetheless reflected in the transformation of the structure of R&D expenditure from about 30% of that being undertaken by firms in firms to somewhere in the region of, of 60 to 70% uh, being undertaken uh, in, in firms. Uh, is a, 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 um, a much more limited shift uh, in Thailand and Colombia, and even recently in, in Colombia, very low proportions of firms appearing to engage uh, in innovative activity. Uh, and an issue that I think is important is the, what, what was the, the distribution of those innovation capabilities across the economy. In the Taiwan Singapore case, uh, those innovation capabilities were dispersed widely across small, medium firms, across a load, large uh, <coughs> set of sectors, uh, as well as largest firms. In Thailand and Colombia, um, the location, the distribution of innovation capability was really very concentrated uh, in a small number uh, of public sector institutions uh, and in a small number of research active uni universities. So, what do we learn uh, from that? Not a great deal. <laughs> so, essentially, I've, I've put to juxtaposed uh, some information about policy systems, policy practice, paths of industrial technological development, a little bit of comment about policy for industry. I've said nothing about the things on the left. The last thing I'm going to do is suggest that you draw uh, causal arrows uh, around this. Uh, that's not what I'm <coughs> suggesting. What I think I learned from that little comparison is that there might be an interesting question to be asked about the role of industry-oriented science technology policy systems within and in relation to the needs for policy change in contexts like Africa. And it might, therefore, I'm coming back to the point of suggesting that this might be an item that takes a more prominent place in our collective research. This might be a, an area for question that takes a more prominent, prominent place. Um, I have, in effect, therefore, really contrasted uh, in a highly simplified way I do it here, uh, two, two patterns. And the question then arises, well, okay, where does Africa uh, fit into that contrast? My impression is that with respect to policy practice, and I emphasize impression, is that African governments are building highly centralized innovation systems with a heavy top-down emphasis focused on R&D functions that are located in centralized public uh, organizations. And this focus I, I, seems evident to me at two levels. It's evident in various national statements of science and technology, STI policy. The Nigerian policy statement of 2011, I think, fits that pattern uh, closely. I think the same, th the same thing is highlighted, is illustrated by the Africa Science and Technology Consolidated Plan of Action, the cross-country regional statement of uh, policy for science, technology, and more than just science and technology, science, technology, and innovation was the, the scope of this policy, policy document. Uh, that came to be accepted uh, just down the road here um, by the collected African ministers of science and technology and their equivalents. What did this report have to tell us? Essentially, 80% of the con content was a list of flagship research and development programs that would be carried out primarily in public organizations. For a moment when I was reading it, I thought I had discovered an exception. There was a thing called a program for building engineering capacity for manufacturing. And I thought, wow, let's go and see if that's going down the other track. It isn't, wasn't, 
that, when you read it closely, is actually entirely focused on issues to do with engineering in universities and related institutes. It says nothing, 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 nothing about anything to do with a system of research and technological innovation that has got to do with firms. Thus, I think what I'm suggesting is that the orient orientation of at least intended STI policy practice <coughs> fits into that box, that that is the dominant focus, that other non-R&D things in those institutes are essentially a rather marginal activity, that R&D-centered things, activities, policy initiatives that are focused on a more dispersed, enterprise-based basis is very limited, and I don't know enough about what happens in that box to offer even a guess. So let me conclude with some speculation. If that horrendously simplified <laughs> set of <laughs> observations about Africa are even a vaguely reasonable approximation to what is happening, it raises questions. If it is important to change the focus of STI policy practice in ways that I suggested are on it might well be in the African context, then that might be difficult because the current focus that I've summarized emerged from the underlying science and technology policy systems of the African countries. The organizational structuring of policy making within the bureaucracy of government, the interests of policy makers, their communities, associated principles and mental models. And in connection with the latter, I can't help feeling seeing the ghost of UNESCO still stalking the land <laughs> with our users still left hanging out in the top right hand corner with nobody being terribly interested in their scientific and technological activities. Does this matter? Well, possibly. I would suggest it does for two reasons. That's the wrong button. Um, first of all, I suggest it matters for science and technology policy itself. With this gap in, in the structure, we know from experience all over the place that it is extremely difficult for central institutions and centers and so on engaged in R&D of various sorts to interact effectively with industrial enterprises, to achieve the impacts they're looking for when there is this gap of competence and innovative activity at a lower level or at a parallel level within industrial enterprises. We know from dozens of studies about sort of absorptive capacity effects now that by and large innovators <coughs> interact with innovators. Innovators don't deliver solutions to non-innovators very often. So if that gap persists, the investment being made at the top in centralized R&D runs every risk of the scenario in Thailand. 40 years after I was there, where there are still consultants coming through annually lamenting the lack of impact from this huge central structure of publicly funded and publicly executed R&D. And similarly, not quite so similarly, but roughly similarly, in Colombia uh, when I was there two years ago on a review of, of, of their innovation system. But I would, I, I would also suggest that it matters from the perspective uh, of industry policy. I think I would argue that a much more coherent 
structure of capabilities probably is very important for many of the things that industry policy is trying to achieve, and in particular this change in structure and the raising of efficiency. That achieving those aims will be difficult with the existing approach to policy uh, for industrial science and technology. Let alone these policy challenges, where obviously one is going to need big solutions, but I would argue that the contribution of industry, or one of the contributions, rather, of industry to poverty reduction depends on this diffused spread of competencies and capabilities to change and modify and alter and incrementally improve uh, the technologies uh, with, with which people are, are earning their living. And I also would argue that the greening of industry will depend in part on big new technologies, but it will also depend in part on dispersed capabilities to modify, to change, to improve, to alter, to adapt, and so on and so forth from a dispersed uh, innovation, innovation competence. Thank you. try to come with some smart comments or some kind of evaluation of what has been going on. But uh, I think whatever I would say would be to dilute something which was just fantastic. And it was definitely in the spirit of Chris. The same grip the same capacity to, in a very clear way, explain extremely complex matters. So I, I just want to propose we give one more applause.